And we are live. What's up, guys? This is Ruben Dua from Dubs Podcast Connection Loop. And today I've got Richard Moore with me. So Richard Moore comes to us uh, from Great Britain, actually, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I've had a chance to kind of check out some of, some of, some of Richard's content online. And his, his vibe is really interesting. Very interesting purpose. We were just actually talking about um, how adversity, trials, tribulations is so much of the form for uh, our path and our purpose and kind of um, what potentially motivates us and what helps us to actually overcome a lot of um, burdens and um, hurdles. So Richard, I kind of love to understand what you're up to, what your purpose is, and, and really what your, your origin story is. Thank you. Yeah. Um, firstly, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, it's really uh, uh, flattering to have that you invited me. Um, yeah, I, I feel that um, there's kind of a couple of things I'm working on at the moment and, and my business itself um, uh, trains um, corporates on, uh, trains their sales teams on, on how to sell and persuade. And I work a lot with uh, those involved in marketing in a in traditional sense and helping with online engagement, things like that. And um, that stems all the way through to a kind of an agency model around um, a whole done for you approach to um, um, online uh, positioning and, and so on. But I also work with um, an events um, uh, kind of initiative I started back in 2018 called Entrepreneur Business Live. And it's um, <clears throat> important to me this because the events are all over the world and they're designed to leverage um attention and engagement and essentially use these techniques that i coach um to get lots of people in the room um to and drive all of the money uh into local charities so mm. um it's really something i i feel has um has mileage and it's wonderful that people are kind of taking it and running with it um and so there's a lot of great new events coming up uh, really soon and my kind of <clears throat> my it, it's all it's all about doing good, you know, and, I'm, you know, it's interesting because as you get a bit older, you gain perspectives on things and talking about origin stories. And I've um, I've always had certain things in my life that have directed me in certain ways. And, uh, you know, I'm 40 this year. So as a child of the 80s, I had um, the kind of upbringing you'd expect where it's, um, you know, you're conditioned that there's a certain route one must take in order to achieve a level of what's perceived societally as 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 success and so it's university because that's the way to go and it's a job in a suit in an office in london <laughs> and that's right. that's it doesn't matter what a job is but it's just as long as it's there and you know i it took me a long time to kind of unbind myself from that uh from that uh, sense of direction because it yeah. was drummed into me and and there's nothing wrong with it because that's the world we're in back then um but then certain things happen, you know, and so I um, went out from the age of 11. Um, I have two sisters, but, the, but from the age of 11, my parents separated and I didn't see my father for another 25 years. And, and so my mum with, with a part time job raised us. And um, and then, uh, the, the, you know, I, I did my corporate job and did really well in the city. Um, but then I pivoted out about seven years ago um to to run my own thing um because certain bad bad stuff happened in life you know uh i had some family members um pass away and um i also had a, my, my first daughter was born as well so it really mattered to me to make sure i was present that that was something that was important and so all these kind of things fed together and and there's been plenty of adversity but using it for good uh to drive you and give you perspective and feel um you know like you're to recognize where where you're where you're doing well and where where you're we're very fortunate is important and you know we've just we've all had another shot in the arm of this this week yeah. with Obi bryant passing away it really affected me again you know and, and this kind of thing keeps reminding us that that you need you need to make the most of of whatever you've got and 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 leave something decent for those after you so wh why do you think um why do you think a lot of people, maybe most people, don't really embrace this idea of 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 adversity and how it can be used for good, how it can be good for providing perspective, providing catalyst. Um, what do you think the what do you think the reason for that is that we get st stuck in that? Yeah, I mean, I, I 
I, I'm really fascinated by and am a student of in, in my own time um, behavior and psychology. And I'm not trained in any way and, or anything like that. But by se- being in sales in different ways for 17 years, it's just, you know, you spend a lot of time around people. And what's clear is that there's it's human and it is animal to uh, have pain avoidance, you know, and if, if bad stuff's happening or may happen or we project that we may fall into bad places emotionally or otherwise, we as animals look to self-preserve and, and avoid those things. <clears throat> and it is easier to a degree for a while to bury one's head in the sand. Um, and it's I feel only through going through some hard stuff that you realize when you pop out the other side that and in fact it's not when you pop out the other side it's later still that you look back and reflect and realize that you've grown somewhat and that mm. something's changed right. you know it there's there's that process there's going through the stuff and you're not thinking whatever it might be you're not thinking you're just doing you're living you're surviving then there comes the aftershock when you're like, wow, I've been through that. And often that is, is a moment when people implode a bit and they think about all the bad things that may have happened. But as I say, later still, you then arrive at your point where you're like, wow, I've, I feel a little, just that little bit more um, stronger and able to deal with things. And, and I, think, I think it takes time, you know, and eventually enough adversity happens to everyone. Um, and for some, perversely, it is a positive that they have it early on. Because it gets them more self-aware, yeah. Sooner, you know, and that like, having that early is if we could all have a lot more self-awareness at the start, it would really make a difference. Well, I think uh, Rumi, the this great um, Sufi poet, he said it best. He said, "Scars are where the where the light enters." Yes, yes. I am. Um, I'm actually in, in in the literal sense. I'm really proud. I had a number of operations a few years back. And I've got a lot like eight or nine scars all across my stomach from the keyhole surgery. And I'm kind of proud of them in a weird way because I'm like, that's stuff I've gone through. And that's my growth is, is that. And I'm, I suppose I'm quite romantic about this kind of thing now. And um, so I, I, I do feel I, I have the right attitude when bad stuff's happening um, because I know I'll grow through it. And it, it means you get to focus on getting through it and handling it. But at the same time, you know that, that there is always something that can be learned from it. And, and I, I, I'm kind of proud of those, those, those scars I have on my stomach. Well, I think, they're, I think they're constant reminders, you know? I mean, I think whether it's a literal scar on our body or it's a metaphorical scar mm-hmm. of a hardship that we went through, I think it's so important to, to stay close to that and to not, yeah. a lot of people say, you know, forget, and let things go. Um, you know, I, I think I think it's the opposite that's true. I think that it's important to lean into kind of the tribulations that we've gone through so that yeah. we can evolve from them. Because if we don't evolve from them, what I believe happens, and this has happened to me a number of times, is that they they enter the subconscious mind. And if you don't mm-hmm. address them, then, you know, they, they haunt you. I mean, these, that's the definition of skeletons in the closet. It's unaddressed yeah. personal issues. Yeah, baggage, you know. <laughs> And I think, you know, that should be revised, that idea of, of um, you know, let it go. And, and, and it should be more, people should be more thinking about choosing their battles because some things should be let go and they typically are the petty things in the moment. And it's, it's fascinating that some people will focus and, and have huge anxiety about little things that, and, yes. and from anyone's perspective, just don't matter because their perspective isn't, isn't right. And, um, you know, you're totally right. It's good to, to return to those places in your head and just just have a little bit of a gratitude and remember what, you, what you've been through. Um, uh, it really matters. So, yeah, I fully agree. You know, there's this there's this idea which is which is very prevalent in, in several cultures. Um, really, it's probably a personality thing, but it's this idea of saving face. And uh, cultures, people, families, you know, they have big belief that we should all save face. We should yeah. not be transparent about the challenges that we've gone through in our lives. Yeah. People don't need to know about that. Personal, professional, you know, getting fired, getting divorced, getting cancer, you know, getting uh, beat up, getting bullied, you know, all sorts of stuff that we go through in our lives. Um, you know, a lot of people feel like you should not disclose that because it makes you vulnerable. It makes you weak and susceptible to criticism, you know, and 
the, the problem with that, I think, is that then we have to we have to hold on to that inside of us and we don't release yeah, it's it. It's not going away because we're not talking about it. If <laughs> it's not going away. Well, that's the right. Yeah, you know, it's not going away. And I mean, I've definitely seen that, um, you know, being, uh, you know, in the uh, kid of sort of parent, Indian parents, you know, being Asian per se, it's a very, very relevant theme that you'll see, mm -hmm. I think, in, in the Asian culture. But I, I think it transcends that. I think it's in a lot of different types of cultures. I mean, yes. there's, there's, there's cliches about, you know, British, Great, Great Britain. I mean, there's, there's a lot of cliches about the stereotypes about being prim and proper. I, I think that's a really good point there. Like, in all cultures have it to a degree. And some more famously than others, but you're right. The step up left thing, like stop complaining, don't don't you know ha have the Brit mentality of being a stoic and push through, which kind of is good because it means that we're not flaky. But at the same time, that you know the classic uh, uh, reaction is that is that people aren't talking about their, their their feelings enough, and and actually again, as we say, you know, it doesn't mean they're going away. But I think you know it all stems from the animal that we are that hasn't evolved yet that that is avoiding social rejection. And it's the fear of what other people will think. And it's, it's just like, if you, can, if you can coach yourself in whatever way possible, that it's okay. And actually people aren't going to throw you out of the tribe, right? Because that's yeah. where it stems from. And the need to have um, a society because that keeps you safe. You know, the, the truth is that, uh, you know, it's not gonna affect you. And, and it actually, you're probably more more qualified to talk about this than, than anyone because uh, of your show. Actually, you find that that people look up to you more as someone who is stronger because you're sh being real and sharing things that you've gone through rather than hiding away and trying to create some kind of veneer of everything's okay here. Well, I think that's really interesting what you say and how you describe this as sort of an animal instinct mm -hmm. of how our goal is to stay in the tribe, to not get kicked out, to not get eaten, to not get left behind, to not get killed, um, to be accepted. Um, you know, this is a basic, basic human need after food and oxygen and water. I mean, this goes back to the, uh, you know, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs where it's so important that, that, uh, you know, that we gain this acceptance, but isn't, isn't that whole system a little antiquated now? It no. is, but it's hardwired into the old animal brain. That's the problem. Uh, in the same way as part that, that that same old part of our brain believes that we are on, because we all come from there originally, that we're all on the African plains and food is scarce. Yeah. And so when there's sweet stuff, so, so honey, for instance, we gorge because you don't know when your next meal is coming from. The old brain, the... Yes the lizard brain the chimp brain the croc brain whoever all the different authors have used different the reptile to... brain <laughs> exactly you know that hasn't evolved and and the truth is that unless you can control it it controls you because it leads it's where your instincts come from and 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 the bottom line is that's where a lot of our problems come from it's avoiding stuff and and the absurdity of saving face the absurdity because it is is just simply not congruent with the life we have now, the, the civilization we've put on top yes. of being an animal now. And I genuinely feel this isn't me flex, and I just think that those people who have learned that that just not caring about that that outcome that actually will never happen of you not being in the tribe and it, and it being a problem for you, um, you know, it's it's absolutely the way to go. And uh, it's fascinating reading about things like behavioral psychology because it feeds directly into my world of selling and persuasion things like yeah, that right. um and, and it is a it's a very interesting thing because when you understand how the human animal ticks you can see why people react the way they do one of my favorite books on this is called um why beautiful people have more daughters um which goes through <laughs> It's really amazing. And by the way, I have two daughters, just so that's another reason why I like them. I, I have one, 15 There you are. So, you know, that's why. So you have, you have the face for uh, uh, the TV, I'm sure. So, but the point here is that, is that there's all of these stories and that kind of thing about why the animal in the person reacts in a certain way. And I think it's a brilliant way of, of showing that we're all being ridiculous when we're like, oh, well, I, I've got to make sure I, I appear this way in front of people. And, and ultimately, when you realize that 
that doesn't matter. And in fact, when you when you actually share how you feel, you attract the right people. It's positively divisive, right? It gets rid of those who like aren't I'm gonna dig how you are, and it really brings close the ones who really see value in what you're really about on an authentic level. And I think that that's very powerful uh to be aware of it. But you can tell people this, but until we really experience it like the hard way by going through it, it's really difficult to, to get our head around, isn't it? Because because society and and culture and you're going against the vibe and the feeling of the majority, which is, oh, you better act in a certain way. Don't stick your neck out too much, you know? Right. I think the, the, the paradoxes that I extract from this conversation is, uh, number one is, so if, you know, I, at one point in my life, I, I viewed life as a, as a celebration. You, you should eat, be married, you know, drink what you want, never excessive, never over the top. Mm -hmm. And it, it didn't bring me happiness, you know, having the four glasses of wine at dinner or having the, the six pieces of chocolate or the, you know, the, the 30 pieces of, of, of cheese or deep fried, whatever, you know, it felt good while I was doing it, but, but it didn't make me feel happy or content. I mean, within 20 minutes, I found myself regretting it. And then yeah. the morning after always sluggish as hell. Right. Yeah. But as I started to contemplate a little bit and I, as I started to understand that the reason why I'm enjoying that really piece of fatty food, that deep fried mozzarella and the way that it's just giving me this amazing hit of dopamine in my brain and these yeah. endorphins and this amazing feeling is because of exactly what you said. This is an unevolved brain, the mm -hmm. reptile brain that is saying you must consume and retain as much fat as possible to stay warm in the prairie <laughs> precisely that's where we haven't evolved yet there's some people that make things up a bit but they say things like you know we we revolve like one percent every ten thousand years we're just yeah. not there yet one day in the future the instinctive animal brain will be mindful and go no no because there's a supermarket so don't worry about it <laughs> but yes. until then you were just this animal and i and it's you know it's amazing because you just feel so much more evolved when you just stop for a second and yes. and, and it's, i think it's good mindful eating as, to take that as a theme you know um to say why do i want to eat this right now and actually what you don't do is stop eating chocolate or cheese and mozzarella and that but you do realize that there is a wonderful moment of contentment because you use that word there's content which is really what we're driving towards um in having a piece of chocolate and savoring it and enjoying the process of it eating um but also simultaneously being aware that because we've not gorged on the entire bar we're just doing that little bit to help the vehicle that we're driving our lives in and it means that we can extend life in a tiny bit of a way and that in turn means we can enjoy more contentment which is very difficult because i think the animal brain leads us to extremes it leads us to too much hedonism it leads us to excess yes and when you bridle it just a bit you let it exist but you control it with a bit more uh, consciousness you do move to a wonderful place where you're like, it doesn't mean I can't have this stuff, but it means with a little bit of a measured approach, I can genuinely have a sustained feeling of contentment and happiness because I can go for the huge spikes of excitement and feel the rush of, of certain things. Yeah. But that brings with it an inevitable low as well. And, and that shortens the life, but it also makes gives you the sluggishness and, and the down the lows as well. And I just think... It's, it's tough, though, because we're all fallible, right? We can't do it all the time, but it's something to work towards. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I think, I think the missing link to, to, to our evolution as a, as a species is, is mindfulness. You know, I think when we are mindful, when we are a mindful culture and a mindful individual, you know, we start to make better choices. And I, as a result, we, we, gain more contentment. I, I truly believe that. You know, I think if you peel the onion back when you want something, when you desire something, and you ask yourself, why do I want that? Yeah. Why do I want that money? Why do I want that car? Why do I want that house? Why do I want that piece of chocolate? If you can really get to a deep place of why you want it, and that's a good, genuine place, there's nothing wrong with that desire. 
Why do I? There's no reason to hold back. Now, on the flip side, if the reason why you want that is for that spike that you mentioned, Mm -hmm. that short-lived moment, it's not sustainable. I mean, it's yeah. We're welcome to do what we want. That spike for that short-lived moment may be compensating for something. Correct. And actually might be compensating for something that's missing and you've got a deeper problem that really needs to be addressed. And and I'm not an authority by any stretch on addiction, but but that's where um, there's this replacement going on of like, well, maybe if I could just keep my escapism is is my tool to move away from the issue that actually needs to be fixed. But I think I think my my view is that mindfulness, whilst isn't doesn't appear to be a natural um uh, you know, like default state for us. I do feel it can be a, a habit and made into something through, you know, it's a bit manual and clunky to begin with. But when you do apply it each time you, uh, for instance, reach for something fanciful to eat, if you're fanciful to, to eat it, um, what you do find is that over time, you do tune into yourself a bit more and it becomes, like I say, it becomes habit. So I do believe that can we can exist in, in, in an estate where we are mindful for a large portion of the time as a natural way of being. It just takes, it takes a bit of habit building, doesn't it? It does. Now you mentioned that, you know, behavioral science, behavioral psychology and how it kind of affects your business. Um, you know, as, as a coach, as someone that guides people to drive more sales, build better relationships, retain customers, get better referrals. As someone that's, that's an expert in this, you know, how deep do you go in your process? Do you, do you really do a, a, a deep dive on, on, on culture and on process and on, you know, methods of communication? Do you have enough time to do that stuff? You're, you're obviously very aware of, Mm -hmm you know, the deepest levels of our existence when it comes to building relationships and communications. Yeah. But what is your process like and how do you ultimately help people? You know, it's a balance because you can't go full tilt on explaining it all because you'd be there for days and you need to be practical in the moment, especially with a uh, private business, for instance, that's like paying you to commercially help it. But what people do appreciate and what is effective is not just telling them what to do it's explaining to a degree why they are feeling like that so um because i've kind of been immersed in the world for my whole career i can i had one like this uh, a few weeks ago where i was doing a one-on-one session with a with a, a sales rep and i said you're feeling like this because this is what's happening to you and we went through it briefly and and what, what you do find is that the more you explain how why people are feeling a certain way and therefore why they're reacting a certain way and then you un- then you flip it and say and this is therefore why your buyer or the person on the other side of the table is reacting a certain way in these situations you help them start getting the general idea of it and you do feel you do find that over time you have to explain the mechanics of it a little bit less which means and what it actually represents i believe is that over a while o- over time that that they are understanding why they're reacting a certain way. And because I'm the person explaining it, there's a level of trust. So I can, I often move to a point, I think after a while where I say, you're feeling this way and they're like, he, he understands me and so I, I get it. And we can be a bit, lot more efficient. I, I hope that I've articulated that well enough. But the, the, the crucial part is that I do explain a little bit of why they're feeling like this, but it really is important that um, it permeates the, the, the work I'm doing, working with culture and persuasion and communication and selling and things like that and marketing uh, and things, because um, just the theory, just just the um, practical application on its own isn't the teach a man to fish approach. It, it, it's far better to, to explain just a little bit more depth on his why we need to approach things in this way. And it gives people so much more of um a sense of understanding that they can then take and run with so i don't necessarily have to be there all the time so um it's interesting because a lot of people have never been spoken to in a certain like in this kind of way and and not approached their what they perceive to be very practical transactional role in one which focuses a lot more on how someone's animal brain for instance is going to react to them in a moment even in a business setting and we move people from this perception that they're pitching um a senior director of an accounting firm to they're speaking to an emotional being first 
And yes, there's a job title and there's a skill set and there's a um, uh, a learned way of reacting that their prospect may have. But first, you're interfacing with that animal and, and learning that side has made people some, you know, some very effective um, um, uh, into very perfe- uh, effective business people. So I've enjoyed that process. So I suppose the short version is like, I, I need to dive down a, a little bit, but over time you find that they get it and they don't have to have quite as much treatment. Otherwise I'd be there all night. Well said, what, what are the three C's? Oh, three C's. Uh, well, everyone seems to have a three C's. My three C's um, with my course, uh, uh, the LinkedIn course is content connections and community. And that's Ooh, in reverse. Order. Nice. Yeah. So, I'm a massive fan of um, working with community. So, uh, you know, the community exists already. You don't build it. And if I've said that in the past, maybe I should revise it. You, you inhabit a community and you gain an audience. You can build an audience, but you inhabit a community. It's about warming that community up. And, and if you look at engagement in sales and influence and persuasion on the, in the online world, Sure, it can start to a degree with content, but the myth is that content is the be all end all. Behind that comes meaningful connection building and a good strategy behind how you approach the right people who are going to be courted and become your audience. Um, And then community work, which is where you should spend the majority of your time. And it's interfacing with them on a human level it's speaking like this you know we're no longer just a connection Ruben with we're having a, an, a a chat and it's clear we resonate on some levels as well so that community work is important and doing things like these interviews means that people get a little bit more of you but it's little things you know like direct messaging <clears throat> sending someone a voice message for no reason other than to keep that relationship going that's the huge monster under the surface and the tip of the iceberg is building your content for instance and that's what drives real engagement and it is literally taking cues from the offline world it is no different in principle if you want someone to do something for you you tend to have to invest a a bit in the relationship first Um, and obviously people are charitable but in the offline world if i want someone to come and help me if i'm sick then they tend to be a friend and and they decide to come and help me uh, if I'm sick because I've been a good friend. We've got a good relationship. That's why a random person off the street doesn't tend to come in and help you, whereas a, a tight friend does. And it's the same principle. It's a community building one. So there's your three C's, but it's important to give them that treatment because people understand not all of those C's are equal. So you you run a uh, you have some sort of a, a face Facebook group or a community group that you that you run or manage or you're part of. That's correct. Yes. So it's called the Entrepreneur Business Group. That's in part supports Entrepreneur Business Live events. Uh, so we've run this since 2015, uh, and all of the events around the world are the speakers are live streamed into the group. So every day we have interesting content, and it's about stimulating conversation and it's a really good bunch so that, i think it's 4200 people in there um and it's just good because that is curated content that drives engagement and brings people together and and you know like allows people to find opportunities and work together but it's nice because we it's about giving a lot back to people in terms of they've decided to show up for the group so we're validating that decision by giving them quality content and a place where they can grow as entrepreneurs and business owners Rather than just, you know, spam your latest, latest promotion kind of thing, which is how you kill groups. It is. It is. That is the best way to kill a group. You're so right about that. Uh, groups. I, I am such a believer in the idea of, of groups, community, really. Um, but yeah. specifically, you know, leveraging the technology and the resources that are out there to, to have a group. A lot of people think, mm-hmm. well, to have a group, I need to physically get people in a room together once a week or once a month. Uh, not the case, you know, Facebook for the last, I, I think a year or two, they've pushed video and they've pushed groups very mm. aggressively. You know, uh, Facebook now has become a TV for us. We watch video content on Facebook. That's what we do. We get sucked in. Yeah. Um, I'm not a huge fan of not, I'm not going to say all the stuff, but I'm going to say a good amount of the content that I'll find on Facebook. I'm not a huge fan of it. It doesn't bring me a lot of 
contentment to use that word. <laughs> um, is it is it funny? Is it is it, is it edu is it uh, you know entertaining for a second? Yes. Is it educational? Not always. Mm -hmm. Now that said, there there is some good content on on Facebook, and I actually believe where the best content, from my perspective and on my feed, comes from the groups. So yeah. I'm I think I'm involved in I think like six or seven groups now. Some of them are are geographically based where I live. And then some of them are based on interests, uh, business and hobbies and whatnot. And I think what's really interesting about groups is that there is there is a, 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 a conduct, there's a, a, a mode of conduct that exists within these within these groups. And some of it is very explicit and it's stated when you sign up for this group or you request to be approved. But a lot of it is just understood. Mm. Don't put salesy spammy stuff in this group don't put links you know the let the administrators sort of guide what type of content could be shared and i think what that's done is that it's really curated the content for the good mm -hmm. because now it it has to stay in that you know the the church and the state they're they're very disparate in this in yeah. this situation and we've learned a lot from that you know we dub has a facebook group and uh, it's a it's a newer effort. It's it's I think it has I think close to two thousand members now, and and that community has been incredible for us because, a it's a place for us to I mean it's your three C's. It's a place <laughs> for us to share our, our content, to build the connections, and then to have that larger community. What it also does for us, which I think is a byproduct of community, is that it helps us to get real time feedback from people. Yeah, you know. Dub is a technology platform that allows people to quickly create, share, and track videos, Gmail, LinkedIn, CRMs. That's a little bit innovative. Mm. We need feedback from people to figure out what's working and what's not working. Hey, how do I integrate Salesforce? Hey, how do I integrate HubSpot? Hey, I found a, a weird bug on the on the Dub mobile app. Mm. You know, that type of information, that's where we get the most value. So mm. You know the give, give, and the and the and the get, get that that's really happening here is we provide content, we provide entertainment, education, and in, yep. in return we we get insight. So what I is think your... that's really, I was going to say it's really powerful that you're doing it that way, and I'm glad it's great to see that you do. Um, one of the companies I work with um, uh, over in the states that does captioning for video called Subtitle. Um, it was really wonderful speaking to their CEO Baird Hall because he said you've got to understand we're the developers right? We can't tell the market what's best for them mm. in terms of captioning software for content creators' videos. We need content creators to tell us that. Yes. So one of the reasons I was working with them wasn't just because I appreciate what they do and, I, and being a brand ambassador is all very nice, but I was like, let's work together under the bonnet. And it's so frontline feedback, not stuff from books or theory. It's like, Here's what people on the street right now on LinkedIn who are winning in video based content creation. Here's the stuff they need. And it's led the way in which they've developed the product. I, I fully agree with that approach. And I'm, I've been the same. My group has, has helped me launch products. And before launching and building them, I've, I've actually put out the poll, you know, would you is there an appetite for, for instance, when I even just one of my my free things was a, that a newsletter that's been running about a year and a half now every single week we give a newsletter on the latest developments in the space we operate in so we do the research to produce it but it started as would you lot you know do you read newsletters once a week poll was overwhelmingly yeah we actually do read the stuff we subscribe to because i was careful about asking that and they um and then it was like so what would you like in it do a poll and they gave us the feedback all the while i'm getting this list of people who of course would you know would be interested in getting it. and then of course when you roll it out they're like great so thanks because that's what we asked for and then we get it and it's just a nice way of kind of uh de-risking the um mvp right as you're building out and it's a, it's a wonderful thing to have that group to it's kind of almost like your own little um uh research group so i quite like that approach too yeah so when you so let, let's just uh, let's go through the process. I'd love to understand um, how how you kind of guide teams. So uh, maybe we can just use Dub as a as a case study or as a as, a, as an example here. Um, you know, we are a technology company. We're a software company. Um, we are a subscription based service. You know, our goal. One of the really interesting metrics about us is that 
we have a very high close rate when we when we do a demo. Like our yeah. demo, our demo to close is like eighty percent. Okay. So that that's it's really good for us because if we can get people to understand how to use this technology, then we can convey the value very easily. Yeah. Now the challenge, of course, is to actually get that demo and the the scale issues around that because of course yeah. that requires that you know, someone on our team, someone on our sales or support staff has to take that call. We love yeah. it. We love providing empathy and compassion and consultation. And frankly, we get a lot of information in return, but we're mm -hmm. always thinking how we can scale, how we can use video, how we can have training mm -hmm. videos and um, certain types of features that are available only for subscribers. But what would you do um, as, as a coach to really help us to, to solve some of those problems, you know, A, from, from a sales perspective, but, but also from from a, from a funnel perspective? Yeah, it's a good question because, you know, you can't do 300 of those calls a day. And the more you're interfacing with these, it would be amazing, wouldn't it? But the more you interface with these people, the more you really have a sense of what their reaction is going to be. And there has to be an element of, of uh, balance and and a little bit of compromise where you you like, okay, do you know what? It's not going to be the tightest conversation, but it can be something akin to it. And I think what what's clear is if your conversion rate is so high from demo, um, it it means actually two things. It means firstly that the demo is solid in converting people, but second, it means that you pre-qualify. Oh, people. big time. But, and that that's the bit often people get wrong and they're like what's wrong with my sales process it's like yes. actually there's nothing wrong with your sales process and your product is amazing but you're trying to ram it down everyone's throats rather than spending nine seconds and just checking if this person's got a budget or not or whatever it might be you know right. just that much qualification in, in the in the first part and if i can uh, there's a to kind of help with the answer this question that one thing i did um when I, I wanted to help people with with sales and the basics uh, of sales was like it, it was difficult because I could only train so many people at a time. And, you know, people wanted a consulting call or having mentoring or whatever it might want to be called. But the problem is you can't do so much and you, you can't scale yourself, but you can bottle your philosophy. And I think that um, so m the way I did it was I created a short video course which bottled the the kind of emphasize on the key things I would have covered. And and I've since made I've made three courses now, one on essentials of LinkedIn, one on on sales and um, uh, and another one as well. Um, that's uh, which actually escapes me completely. I can't remember what it is, <laughs> but it's fine. So the point is that these courses are there to um be found by people who want you to help them but you can't always be there for them so, so they actually get a kind of a sense of um who you are and as a funnel as well as an in an introductory um uh educational tool it's a very powerful way to be leveraging video to again appeal to that animal center of the brain because what we're doing is we're saying Here's an opportunity for you to be familiarized with, sure, the product and process, but also the person behind it. And that's the reason why I do a live show every week, for example, because what you're doing is you're conditioning the subconscious of the audience that about what of how you are as a person and consistently consuming video on a person or, or, a, or a, the vibe of a brand or something like that is a wonderful way of building familiarity. And for humans, enough familiarity over time builds the trust level that's required to help them self-select and pivot into saying, hey, can we buy it? So they convert themselves so much more because of the way in which you're putting yourself in front of them in, in a scaled way. So one thing that would really help is 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 leveraging video because you can get it to people and it can be you know it, it may be that you have a, a kind of a, a demo style set of videos that explains how the product works sure but it might be that at the top of funnel you have shorter videos that explain um facets of the problem that you solve through the device of your product so it's not selling the product itself and the, you know how it works because no one cares how things work um it's selling little solutions here and there and that's so powerful because you're leveraging human curiosity 
which is very powerful. We're all oh, voyeurs. Yeah. We want to check each other out and store. And, you know, if, for instance, there's anyone listening to this, I'm sure there are millions of people listening to this, but if there's anyone listening to it who seems to find that there's a level of interest in me, but who had never heard of me, job one is click on who's Richard Moore and, and go from there, just like we do in, in the offline world, meet someone in person, then you check out their Instagram. It's the same here. And, and, and if you can be in front of people enough, through just sharing social video but practical ones that are information akin to understand uh, to helping someone uh, um, fix it or solve a problem that in turn ultimately your product solves you do find you get a lot more people starting to check you out because that hey that's quite useful and that's that problem is in the ecosystem i inhabit and that does map very um um well to people saying do you know what the, and i'm the right person so they they you start getting a lot more inbounds and that converts neatly into the um uh, into product demos i i can say this with authority because i i have this very pure signal with my videos about the thing i talk about which is sales and, and, and engagement and those things naturally bring a lot of inbound sure traffic but they like, people convert themselves and and all the time you get these messages you know hi i love what you talk about with sales can you help or can we talk and so on and that's that's the way to get the benefit of the fact that distribution is possible for free um uh, on on the platforms out there and and indeed then um it may be that you can automate a lot more of the demo side of things um because in fact they're warmed up to you and if you can warm an audience to I like this brand I like this person I want to inhabit their world they're helping me it does mean they will therefore want to listen to a demo even if it's pre-recorded and that that is a way I mean for instance my courses sell themselves literally in the sense the entire process of the funnel is automated now so I don't close people or anything they sell themselves and decide to go through the process of the landing page and, and get out their card and pay for it and so on and, and that's because the first entry point videos the little short videos and snippets at the top of the funnel map all the way through to that and i think that's something that's very very good with the kind of product you're talking about you mentioned something that's really interesting to a lot of people i mean all this is the dream for most salespeople is that people sell themselves you don't have to quote unquote close people. Yeah. And what is the what is the evolution towards that? What what are the major problems that you feel like you can help solve? Yeah, the, the problem. I think the, if, I, if I understand your problem, your your question correctly, because a lot of people are are trying to understand how to get people to to decide to buy themselves, and that's kind of the hard bit done then. And in fact, the best salespeople are the one, the, or the best mechanism is the one where the salesperson just simply helps them over the line. Yes. Much like a supermarket, where the salesperson's job is actually just ringing through the cash register what you've decided you want to buy. And it's again, this is the familiarity play. Um, it's it's a very difficult thing to to make someone feel that tangibly that they're, they're buying into something, but exposure to a person or brand or something over time builds that familiarity and therefore that trust. Elon Musk with Tesla is an example uh, of some someone where the next car that we've not seen yet that he puts out will be good in the sense that it will sell because people want to like it. The next Star Wars film could be an absolute flop, but people will want to like it because they're Star Wars fans and they've been they're used to it and they've grown up with it. And so you're and, you're talking about sort of a brand halo effect that happens. Yeah, and 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 it, it actually stems from frequency and consistency. And if you look, for instance, at my videos, it's just me sitting in a chair. It's not particularly compelling to look at, but by just simply constantly knocking away on this one kind of general area of work those that need or, or find it interesting and those who, who kind of in addition find me in whatever way stimulating when and as and when they need help they know that i'm their man for it are there other people who sell the same services yes are there any that are better possibly but 
they decide to go with me because they're consumed and are bought into me. So the, 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 the kind of thing to tell the salespeople is, sorry, it takes time if you want to do it this way, but it's seriously fulfilling if you do take the longer route of warming the audience and, and your energy going to warming that community because then they start coming to you. And there's a heck of a difference between someone you manage to close in a very short space of time who does give you the money and buy the product and someone who wants to buy from you, like, as in emotionally is hyped that they get to buy your product and they're sold to their core on not just the solution you're giving them, but also that it came from you. And there's that, you know, I'm not saying it's kind of cult-like, but the truth is they're leaning into you more because they really dig your world. And the nice thing is there's enough volume out there. What is it? 630 million people on LinkedIn, for instance, that you can't really miss. You've just got to keep making sure you're saying the right thing to the right people sufficiently uh, regularly. I connect to that. Uh, just yesterday, I was listening to a podcast uh, on Tim Ferriss's podcast with Gary yeah. Keller, the founder of the real estate uh, company, Keller Williams. And yeah. Gary proceeded to share his story on how when he initially was looking for a job after college, he had a degree in real estate, that he was rejected. And that when someone did an analysis, a profile analysis on his personality, that they claimed that he would not be good in sales. Right. And and as a result, uh, you know, what he did was he said, well, that's completely wrong. And I'm going to go and do what I'm supposed to do. And I'm going to prove this person wrong and I'm going to accomplish all the goals that I want to. And that's exactly what he did, creating Keller Williams. And, and it's really one of the largest real estate companies yeah. on the residential side. And I think what was really interesting about hearing that is that, you know, getting data like that, whether it's when you're young or quote unquote old, it really doesn't matter. But getting information from someone or a group of people that states that you're not good enough, that you don't have the personality for this, you don't have the profile for this, you wouldn't be a good salesperson. You can't close a person on the phone. You'd be a terrible consultant. To hear some of these things, you know, I always think about when do we take those things seriously and say, you know what, I've been practicing the violin for four years now and every time I do it, it sounds like, I'm hurting cats and windows mm. crack, or yeah. should I say, you know what, I'm going to try harder and I'm going to, I'm going to prove people wrong. And, you know, there's this idea of, of F U energy that people yeah. talk about. And sometimes this energy can be really used for, for good. If it's rechanneled, mm. um, as long as it's kind of productive and positive ultimately. Yeah. Um, but on the flip yeah. side, of course, um, you know, maybe you do kind of have to listen to people. What is your take on that? I mean, I hear this all the time for salespeople mm -hmm. that, oh, when I started as a salesperson, no one thought I could close. I couldn't even sell ice to an Eskimo, you know. Mm -hmm. What is your take mm -hmm. on that? Uh, it's a really good point. And, and look, no one has a clue what to do when it comes to sales. And it's one of those things where if you stick it out, it can be the thing that you you end up good at. I didn't want to have a sales job. I just had to have a job. I didn't get funding for my PhD. So I was like, OK, I need to get a job quick. So let's have interviews. And the first one I went applied to was the first one I got. And the first one I got was a job. So I just took it. And, and the reason why I ended up good at it was because I had been brought up that you can't quit at stuff. Um, so I had to stick it out through the pain. The difficulty here is that. I think it's William Salman who wrote uh, who, who wrote about managing oneself uh, as a Harvard Business School book. I think it's like a really small pamphlet. And one of the things he talks about, in essence, is a self-awareness thing of like, you need to audit what your weaknesses are. And some people just aren't good at stuff. And the thing is, it's more about what outcome you're after, because if you're no good at violin, and everyone's like, you're rubbish. It's so bad. It's been so long. But you love playing it then you should continue because it's about self-expression and enjoying the process and things like that. And if it's something that makes you content, then you should do it. But the difficulty is that a lot of people will stick at things and think that because they don't quit, it means they're entitled to success. Mm. And that's not the right way of looking at it. I think the best approach is if you've decided that you want something to happen, and you don't feel you're improving, 
then you've got to ask yourself, am I A, doing like pushing myself as much as I can into this? So I'm not like showing up once a week, but actually genuinely putting the, a lot of effort in. And am I B, seeking resources to improve me and level me up? Because if I just keep playing the, piano, the violin to myself on my own every day, that doesn't mean I'm going to get better. And if I do, it'll be very slow incline compared to if I go and get a, a tutor to help me. And I think that the truth is that we've got to be, be careful when we look at how other people audit, if they're good or bad at stuff. People talk, and I talk about this a lot with with um, with sales directors who are recruiting. They say, "Well, I need someone who's got X, Y, and Z traits in a salesperson." And often, that when they say it that way, what they really mean is, "I want someone like me." And in <laughs> fact, you know, they just do, and it's like it's surprising that, and just like you are. But in fact, what I've found is that anyone can sell if they want to, and if they uh, understand that doing it in their way albeit sticking to certain, staying on certain rails and following certain structure and approaches and patterns. If they do it their way, they are more likely to win. So bringing from themselves their real self. If you force yourself to act in a certain way that's not you, you're not going to do so well with it. And it's, it's interesting when you're asking the question because it reminded me of, I think, last year, and it sounds like a weird parallel, but it's really relevant here. Um, when I, I watched my first Super Bowl, and Tom Brady was, you know, I've never really been into American football. Like Tom Brady was, you know, playing for the Patriots. And I was like, this guy seems to be a big deal. And I watched this di- this documentary on him. What was fascinating was that everyone was saying, you know, he didn't have the best throwing arm. He wasn't the biggest guy. He wasn't the fastest guy. And then, then someone said, but the problem is that all of the scouts that wrote him off, and he was really far down the draft, I think is the term. They didn't, they didn't understand that the guy had so much heart. And that's something that's not measured. And, and what you've got there is a guy who wants it. And that's what it comes down to is if you really, really want to be the best at whatever it is you do, then then you've got to go full into it. And that that means being a full student all the time for the thing you want to be great at. And the, the problem with listening to advice from other people who aren't an authority on it is that you're listening really to their projection of themselves mm. as opposed to someone saying, do you know what, this is what you'd need to do. And I'm, mm. I'm telling you as an expert who's been there, as opposed to friends and family and peers who might not have experience in that thing. Well, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, heart cannot be measured when it comes to passion, when it comes to perseverance, when it comes to not giving up, um, you know, it, back to the violin example. Yeah. You know, I, I think of if, if you play the violin, and this is all, of course, a big metaphor, but yeah. you might start playing classical music. That's where I started the violin. The reason why I mentioned the violin is because I was terrible at playing the violin. And right. I still have my childhood violin, by the way, in my garage. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and I ultimately, you know, I, I did find my instrument, which was percussion and, and later guitar. But okay. I, I guess the point of my story is that even if you're not great at playing what violin is typically used for, which is classical music, there's yeah. so many different ways to pivot the violin, mm. different types of music, whether it's folk or whether it's rock or whether it's something highly, you know, experimental. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and that and that really for me is is I think the most exciting aspect of creative expression juxtaposed with not giving up. Because yeah. even though the the major community of of x might not accept you for your mm-hmm. talents and for your expression there is some other community that mm-hmm. might say you are a true innovator yeah and that's amazing you know when that's I think right of, and i yeah. totally agree you can really divide derive pleasure by by looking at the versatility i was the same with piano and so you know normally you learn the standard stuff in piano and then there's the classical music as I went through the grades. And, was, and I remember saying to the piano teacher, this was like 30 years ago, saying like, I just, I'm like, I'm not, I don't, don't care about learning to play fur release. I want to play something. I want to play jazz and stuff like that. Because that when I watch someone playing that, that is fun. And that gets me excited. And she was like, OK, so let's do that then. And suddenly this thing that was a chore for me as a 10 or 11 year old to learn each week became this thing that was fun and exciting. And it's, it's about how you, pers- your perspective on something. And one of my favorite sayings, if you don't like it, change it. And if you can't change it, change your attitude. And, and it's, um, it solves all problems looking at things that way. So yeah, that's, it's a really nice way of, uh, it's a really nice metaphor, I think. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think jazz and and blues really. I mean, those are great examples of you know if you look at some of the earliest earliest kind of jazz, rock, blues, soul that that whole genre. You know, if if you were to look at them through the frame of popular music a little mm. bit before their time, mm. they would have been seen as uh, as as crazy. You know, it's it's kind of yeah. like that that scene in Back to the Future where. Michael J. Fox's character gets up and he plays the guitar and, you know, Johnny be good. And, and everyone right. in, the, in the crowd is just frozen because they don't know what he's playing. It's yeah. rock music from the future. Yeah. I mean, that's what innovation looks like, mm -hmm. you know, and, it's destructive, and right. And, and there is the small sliver of people who are like, no, but hang on, this is really good. And most people don't get it. Right. And there, of course, then you've got the wonderful world of early adopters. And, and I, I, we live in this all the time. You know, there's the latest thing being this. It's a weird parallel, but it's the same. Like it's the smart home thing. You know, we've got Alexa here. We've got the the Nest. You know, the smart thermostat, and it's all first generation stuff. So it didn't work half the time. But but I'm like the fanboy of it all. Going, this is excellent. I love. I can see how I love this thing. We're gonna have it, and and everyone else is like, it doesn't work. It's really annoying. It like it doesn't listen to you probably. I'm like, but that's but that's like. That's that's I get it, and eventually enough people will, and then the masses get into it, and and you know in ten years time we'll all just be talking to stuff in our house, I suppose. But um, you know, it's that was, that was a really good scene. I did enjoy that. In that film. Well, I, I think it's I think it's all about ease of use. I mean, I'll I'll, uh, I'll show off a little bit, and I'll show you something kind of cool here. Mm -hmm. Hey Alexa, turn the studio off. Okay. <laughs> nice. You know, I, I I'm all about it, man. It's. Techno the purpose of technology is to make our lives easier, you know? Absolutely. And I think with, um, let me, let me turn this back on here. I'll use this. Yeah, I'll Alexa, turn the, have... turn the studio on. <laughs> it's a great way for people to yeah. mess with me. If they just say that Alexa will, will listen. I'll have to remember that. I always mute mine for interviews. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, last thing you want to do is getting on the topic about, it. but I'm the same. And my life's like, you're standing next to the light switch. Why are you stubbornly using Alexa to turn it off? I'm like, it's just, it's just like, I want to get into it, you know, that's the thing. Right. <laughs> well, I think, I think um, one of my great takeaways from this is that, you know, whatever personality that, that we have, that whoever's listening, that you have, um, it's good, you know? It's mm. about not giving up. It's about leaning into who you are. And, you know, maybe you're not meant to be a classical, you know, concert violinist. Maybe you're meant to be a rock star. Maybe you're meant to be a jazz player. Maybe you're meant to use your personality in a way that hasn't been necessarily used for yeah. sales and communication and business development. But because you're good, because you're on your purpose, because you're providing value, because you're helping people, that people yeah. will actually see your gifts and yeah. it will make you unique. Why would you yeah. want to be like everyone else? Quite right. And with every year I get older, I, I feel that more and more. I say, and you, you almost... You, you you know you want to push yourself away from a herd because it's better to be your unique self and i just think that the, the, the crucial part though is that you try your thing because you'll never know if you are best positioned as a striker on a football field rather than a winger until you play football and you'll never know if you're a classical violinist or a you know, a jazz violinist or an experimental violinist, unless you play the violin, you know, you, you know, you can't sit on the sidelines and use conjecture. You got to go and play. Well said, well said, man. Uh, where, where can folks find you, man? LinkedIn, socials, website. Yeah. So uh, if you go to the Richard Moore, M W R E dot com, uh, on the homepage is all the different channels there, but yeah, on LinkedIn, um, you can go to, uh, Richard, what was it? slash in slash Richard James Moore and uh, I inhabit that place a bit or of course there's the group I might as well plug it uh, so entrepreneur business group on Facebook people can join in uh, and watch the uh, watch the events but uh, yeah it's been a, a real pleasure thank you so much for having me thank you so much for having uh, having this time with me man I, I really appreciate it Richard Thank you so much, man. And um, I, I, it sounds like a wicked show. I'm gonna go and watch, uh, listen to some more podcast episodes from you. Sounds good, man. And I will. Yeah. Uh, I want to send you a couple of invites. So I'll talk to you very soon. That'd be amazing. Yeah, I must dash. Thank you so much, man. It's been a real pleasure. Likewise. Thank you. And just right go. Um, when do you t tend to put these out? Is there like a queue of say a month or so, or is it? Um, actually, we're we're pretty we're pretty fast. So it'll be like a week. Well, let me know and I'll spam my whole group. And okay, sounds good. Sick thing. Sounds good. <laughs> a mustache. Thank you so much, man. And I'm so sorry for constantly delaying on you. All good, Richard. Talk to you soon.